Greetings, I'm Mary, aged 35, and the proud mother of a six-year-old son named Jerry, who truly brightens my world. Regrettably, the same cannot be said for his dad and grandmother. I have a gripping tale that continues to send shivers down my spine. I never anticipated sharing such a story, but here it goes. A few years ago, my husband and I embarked on a journey to visit his family in Toronto. I was eager to reunite with his mother, whom I hadn't seen since our wedding approximately six years prior. Little did I know what awaited me. It seemed my mother-in-law was either unable or unwilling to visit us. Despite my inquiries, she consistently cited pressing work-related emergencies as barriers. During the initial six years of my son's life, he had not encountered his paternal grandmother, a matter of concern that he would express by asking, Mommy, when will I get to see Grandma? Despite the challenges, I made the decision for our family to undertake the journey, even though common sense dictated that she should be the one to travel, considering the majority of our family, including extended relatives, resided in San Diego. Regardless, I was resolute in ensuring that Jerry got to know his grandmother, prompting our trip. Upon our arrival, we were greeted by Rebecca, whose stern and grim appearance matched her no-nonsense character. Witnessing her lack of emotion during her first meeting with her grandson was surprising. Hi, Grandma. It's Jerry, your grandson. Hello, little one. I hope your flight was pleasant. Her reply was concise, as though any affectionate gesture might elicit discomfort. Jerry, an embodiment of innocence and love, found the cool reception puzzling. Nevertheless, fueled by his positive spirit and affection, he clung to the hope of building a meaningful connection. Hey, Mom. Hi, son. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Let's head home. I'm freezing. I can't believe I forgot how cold Toronto can be. You should consider moving back here. It's better than San Diego. I don't believe we can handle so much down there. It seems impossible. However, you can work remotely, right? Honestly, you shouldn't be working. You should retire and rest, Rebecca. Why not move to San Diego and be closer to us and all the lively characters? No, I'm fine here in my cold and cool weather. Cold and cool are understatements. We were practically freezing. I made sure to bundle up Jerry in as many layers as possible. He had never experienced this level of coldness before, so I was extremely worried. But for some reason, his grandma was obsessed with the cold. During our second day in Toronto, she nonchalantly proposed at the breakfast nook. How about going for a walk? Considering a stroll in this weather, weren't there warnings about an impending blizzard later today? Daddy, what's a blizzard? It's a frigid snowstorm that's both windy and quite intimidating. Oh dear. Exactly, quite alarming. I don't think venturing out in that weather is a good idea, Rebecca. Come on, if you keep coddling that child, he'll grow up to be overly cautious. You have to expose him to the harsh realities of life. He's six years old. And given it's a blizzard, Rebecca, I don't believe that reasoning applies here. Seriously? You intend to show disrespect within the confines of my own home? No, not at all. It wasn't my intention to disrespect you. I apologize if my words came across that way. I was just trying to express that, fine, we can move forward then. Mom, I'm not sure it's a wise decision. We're going to your favorite spot, Benjamin. Remember, behind the rock near the waterfall. Really? The last time I visited, I was probably six years old. Consider the importance of sharing one of your cherished spots in Toronto with your son, who is now the same age you were back then. You make a valid point. Plus, we both know a lot about Toronto weather and we'll ensure everything is safe. So, Mary, please don't worry. We've got this under control. Okay, only if you're certain. I don't know anything about this, obviously, Jerry doesn't either. So let's make sure to stay close. Yeah, sure, no worries. We embarked on our journey toward the supposed favorite spot. I can't fathom how someone could relish this cold weather so much. Perhaps. Frankly, I'd rather avoid the bone-chilling cold of this place. Nevertheless, I needed to ensure that Jerry was having a good time. The sole reason we persisted in this adventure was that every time his face lit up with joy and amazement at what he was witnessing. At a certain point, though, fatigue set in. It was evident that Jerry was also weary, but he refrained from complaining, wanting to maximize his bonding time with his grandma. Along the way, we passed an antiquated cabin with wisps of smoke emerging from it. Look, a cabin! Yes, sweetie, it's a cabin. Guys, would it be all right if we pause and rest for a while? Perhaps the people in the cabin might be willing to accommodate us for a bit. After all, we are in Toronto, and Toronto is known for being super nice. That's not funny, and it's a bit derogatory to suggest that all of us are kind. Oh, I'm so sorry, I was attempting humor and I didn't realize it was in poor taste. Yeah, well, it seems like you're unaware that many things you do are in poor taste. 
Nevertheless, we continued along the path, growing wearier by the minute. Carrying Jerry, his added weight didn't contribute to my alertness. In the distance, I spotted Benjamin and Rebecca moving swiftly. I called out to them, urging them to slow down. Oh, come on, you slow pokes. I'm 62 and I'm outpacing you too. Hurry up. As I mentioned earlier, we don't embark on these adventures frequently. Hurry up. You're going to miss the best part. What? I can't hear you. Please slow down. At this juncture, Benjamin and Rebecca seemed to have vanished. The snowfall intensified, and it appeared that the anticipated snowstorm was about to hit us. Everything around us turned white, and Jerry began to cry. I grew increasingly anxious as the cold wind howled through the seemingly deserted forest, whipping snow into my eyes and stinging my skin. Clutching my son tightly against my chest, I endeavored to shield him from the biting cold as we trudged through knee-deep snow in search of any signs of help. Hours had elapsed since Benjamin and Rebecca had abandoned us in the middle of nowhere, miles away from the nearest town or shelter. She had taken my husband with her, leaving me and my son to fend for ourselves in the freezing wilderness. I felt a mix of fury towards her and my husband, but more than anything, I was terrified for my son's safety. Mommy, it's so cold, I want to go home, my son whimpered. I know, my baby. I'm so sorry about all of this. I promise I'll find help for us, okay? Don't you worry one bit. As we stumbled through the snow drifts, I felt my body growing weaker by the minute. I knew we couldn't survive much longer in these conditions and urgently sought a place prioritizing safety. Just when hope seemed lost, a faint light appeared in the distance. We stumbled towards it, half blind and half frozen until we finally reached a small cabin from before, its puffs of smoke still billowing in the harsh wind. With the little strength I had left, I knocked on the door as hard as I could and then slumped against it. A voice from within called out, Oh, George, get some boiling water and some blankets right now. A kindly old couple took us in, graciously allowing us to shed our frozen clothes, bathe in the warm water they provided, and sit by the fire. They offered us fresh clothes, hot soup, and blankets to wrap ourselves in. As we huddled together in the warmth, my anger and frustration began to boil over. Why would they? Would they do that? I hope they freeze out there. There are more people out there. We have to go and get them. No, don't bother. It's my good-for-nothing mother-in-law and husband. They left us out there to freeze. You tell a lie. Why do such an awful thing? I knew that Rebecca was always like this, but Benjamin, no way he would do that to us. Hold on a moment, Rebecca. That name rings a bell. If she's a woman with a slender build, always reserved and serious, does she wear purple glasses and have a mole on her upper lip? Exactly. How do you know her? She typically roams through these parts, but it's quite unusual during this season of frequent snowstorms. I've never spotted her around here at this time of the year. How peculiar. Now, my dear, please share how you're acquainted with her. I'm her daughter-in-law. We came to visit from San Diego because she hadn't seen her grandchild Jerry since he was born. I hoped they would bond and get to know each other, but she appeared disinterested even after our long journey. Jerry was cradled in my arms, peacefully asleep with a smile on his face. Thank goodness he made it. Thank goodness he's safe. The mystery of how his little body endured all of that still lingers with me to this day. However, as I looked at him, frustration welled up against his ineffectual father and grandmother. How could she not come down to visit that beautiful baby? He's a joy to behold, bringing tears to our eyes when we think about what happened. You see, we don't have any children of our own. We couldn't conceive. Hence, we decided to settle here and live amidst the mountaintops, an existence we've always desired. Yet, we can't escape the emptiness in our hearts. To learn that someone privileged enough to have such a lovely grandchild has chosen complacency is unforgivable. You know, I've always had an uneasy feeling about Rebecca. I've shared this with you, George. That woman doesn't seem right in the head. I called out to them, urging them to wait for us, but they continued ahead. They could hear me, yet they chose not to listen. Why would they do that? Sometimes we don't understand why people commit such thoughtless actions. All we can do is strive to do our best. The rest of the evening was spent in conversation, and despite my lingering frustration, an overwhelming sense of relief washed over me. I knew that Jerry and I were safe. Morning came, and it seemed the blizzard had subsided. Checking various websites, I found weather reports stating it was now safe to navigate through the town and city. I exchanged contact information with Sarah and George, expressing gratitude for their love and care. There's no need to thank us. We just did the right thing. Anyone with half a heart would have done the same. Please let me escort you back to your home, George offered. They accompanied us to our residence, 
only to find Benjamin and Rebecca sitting comfortably on the front porch, seemingly unconcerned about the harrowing experience Jerry and I had faced the day before. I got out of the car and couldn't contain my anger. What the hell is wrong with you people? How could you leave us there? It was slowing us down. We wanted to see the frozen waterfall, Benjamin defended. Are you serious? Jerry could have died last night. Don't you care about that, Benjamin? To be fair, you could have just stayed home if you weren't ready for this adventure, Rebecca retorted. At that moment, my vision turned red and I was ready to unleash my anger, shouting and kicking to let the whole world know how heartless and sick they were. Not only did they abandon us, but they also seemed to have no remorse for their actions. It felt as if they were intentionally putting us in harm's way. Before I could unleash a torrent of irreversible actions and words, George held me back, urging me to compose myself. Jerry remained in the car with Sarah, witnessing the confrontation. It took a moment for me to regain my composure, but even though I had calmed down, my demeanor remained aggressive and argumentative. You abandoned us, and we could have died, Benjamin. Don't you care about that? Don't you care that your mother put our lives in jeopardy? Don't be so dramatic, Mary. She wasn't trying to do that. The reason we didn't come back for you is that we believed you could find help and shelter. You pointed out that cabin, and it seems you got the help you needed, albeit without thanks to us or your mother. I can't believe what I'm hearing right now. How can you be so cold and callous to your wife? I'm tempted to come over there and knock some sense into you. Try it, old man. I dare you. Enough, everyone. Don't give me a headache. Listen, Mary, I'm sorry you couldn't handle the cold weather, but I swear there was no ill intention on my part. Oh, really? Why would you go tracking at this time of the year? We never see you during this season, so why now? Why now when you have a child who just wanted to bond with you? Someone could argue that this level of gross negligence was intentional. Rebecca, there's no way an experienced tracker like you would travel during this time. Only experts can deal with the weather like this, not novices like Mary and a child like Jerry. You're a sick and twisted, pathetic individual. This seemed to break through Rebecca's cold exterior momentarily as she looked pained but she quickly returned to her Wicked Witch of the West demeanor. I don't know what you're trying to insinuate, but if you're looking for a battle, I can assure you that you'll lose. Don't forget that I'm a wealthy woman with access to the best legal representation. Let's see how your little argument plays out in court, old man. You two are sick, and I never want to see you again. I hope you rot in hell. You know what, Mary? I don't care anymore. I don't care about keeping up appearances for you or anyone else. So let me be clear for everyone to hear. I don't care about you and that baby. Honestly, I wish both of you had died yesterday. At least this way, you'd stop bothering me about meeting that baby. Do I look like I care? I found myself moving toward her as if my body had a mind of its own. Walking up to her, I slapped her, continuing to deliver slaps and kicks until Benjamin and George intervened. Mary, how dare you? How dare I? How dare you sit there and defend this witch? She had it coming. I'll sue you. How dare you put your hands on me? She didn't mean that. Look, tensions are high right now. Why don't we all take a deep breath? Let's come inside and sort this out. You are a weak and pathetic man, and I hope you spend the rest of your life atoning for what you did to your son. Before Benjamin could respond, I spat squarely in his face and headed inside. Gathering both Jerry and his belongings, I got into the car with Sarah and Jerry. Mommy, I'm scared. What's happening? Why did you fight Grandma? Sweetie, I'm so sorry you had to see that. Things are complicated here, and I don't want to lie to you but I'm afraid you're a bit too young to understand. For now, I'm sorry to tell you that it seems like Grandma and Daddy don't want us here. We can't be here because Daddy and Grandma aren't very nice people, and I don't want you to be around people who aren't nice. But Sarah and George are nice people, aren't they? Yes, I love Sarah and George. Can Sarah and George be my Grandma and Grandpa? Oh, bless your heart, my sweet child. Of course, I can be your Grandma. I'll always be your friend and promise to take care of you if you need me to. George got in the car and drove us to a hotel where we could rest and recuperate. Unfortunately, the whole ordeal was overwhelming. I feared for the future of both Jerry and me, as it hinted at a potential divorce due to the power and influence of Benjamin and Rebecca. I decided to talk to Sarah and George about it once Jerry was fast asleep. What am I going to do? I might end up in jail. Nonsense, that hag won't press charges. But what if she does? She won't press charges because we have evidence of her conspiracy to commit murder. How did you manage this? We always anticipate, dear. We discreetly documented the entire situation. Now, you can take this recording with you and use it as evidence against your husband and mother-in-law in court. How did you even pull this off? You're like angels in disguise. 
Hush, my dear, don't concern yourself with the details. Just listen to the audio recording. As we listened, it became evident that the entire incident had been recorded, including the moment when I physically confronted her. Now there's a possibility of facing charges for physical assault. Oh God, why did I do that? Listen, my dear, you acted as any loving mother would. You're a protective mama bear, and you were defending your child. Frankly, I wish Howard and Benjamin hadn't intervened. You would have given her a proper lesson. But the key is, if you had physically confronted her, the wounds would heal. You need to hit where it hurts. Their finances. Sue her for everything. Divorce that man and leave with the money. But the recording captures me hitting her. What are you talking about? At that moment, Howard isolated the audio clip of my attack and removed it. I don't hear anything about you fighting someone, and I certainly don't hear any threats of legal action. I was overwhelmed with gratitude for these people. They were truly my guardian angels. The next day, we headed home. I ignored calls and messages from Benjamin and Rebecca, who seemed to be attempting damage control. It puzzled me why it took them this long to realize their wrongdoing. However, I paid no heed. It was too late to apologize. Allow me to elaborate. Upon returning home, I meticulously built my case against my mother-in-law and Benjamin. Utilizing the funds at my disposal, I enlisted the services of the finest lawyer available. We presented the case and, thankfully, after some time, I emerged victorious in the lawsuit. My mother-in-law settled, awarding me a staggering $2 million. I was genuinely astonished at the substantial amount I managed to extract from her, although she persistently sent me death threats throughout our legal battle. In the case of Benjamin, we naturally divorced. Due to his significant role in the matter and his gross negligence, he was compelled to provide additional financial compensation on top of the predetermined alimony and child support. With this financial influx, I was able to reset my life. I established a flourishing daycare near my residence, aptly named Sarah's Playhouse. Furthermore, I flew Sarah and George to San Diego to commemorate our victories once all settlements were finalized. Here's to a fresh start for Mary and Jerry. May they thrive. Cheers to Grandma and Grandpa. I love you both. Not only did I rid myself of the toxic influences that were my ex-mother-in-law and ex-husband, but I also gained substantial financial resources and love from the right sources. Sarah and George are even contemplating a move to San Diego after spending their entire lives in Toronto. Perhaps a change in scenery is what they need. Regardless, I'm immensely grateful for this new chapter in my life.